Nearly three weeks after its rollout, the Kerry Boxer Climate Bill is apparently undergoing some substantial changes. In fact, the entire bill may be rewritten from scratch. This is an assertion, though, that Senator Kerry's office tells Clean Skies News simply is not true. Clean Skies Tyler Suters has been talking with senators about the climate bill and where they stand. So, Tyler, let's start with the bill itself. You said this morning uh, that the Kerry Boxer Bill is somehow being rewritten in, in some form. You later heard from Kerry's office. Uh, right. Let's talk about, first of all, Susan, what I heard recently. That is going into this morning. Uh, I spoke with an insider source of mine, someone who was involved in the Senate negotiating process on this climate bill, was also involved in the House negotiating process on the waxman markey climate bill. He told me that this John Kerry, Lindsey Graham alliance is gaining momentum. It is gaining influence as well. And that the staff members, the teams for John Kerry's office and Lindsey Graham's office were rewriting this climate bill essentially from scratch. Well, a few hours after our newscast this morning, I did hear from Senator Kerry's office who got in touch with us saying that they had seen the report and that part of it wasn't true. That's their assertion. Quoting now, this is a statement I received just within the last 15 minutes from John Kerry's office. Kerry and Graham are not rewriting the Kerry Boxer bill. They will, however, continue working together to get to 60 votes. Of course, building upon the op-ed in the New York Times that both senators wrote together last Sunday outlining the five key points they both want included in this climate legislation. Susan, I did send a number of emails, made phone calls to John Kerry's and also Lindsey Graham's offices looking for a little further explanation why this word may be coming out that they're rewriting the bill, why these offices say they are not where the process stands right now. But that statement is all we have to go on as we right. speak. Okay, so regardless of who writes this bill, senators are very divided over a cap and trade plan, and that includes Democrats as well. It does, Susan. I don't think it's necessarily surprising when we talked about all the divisions that were in place over the energy bill, the first half of the energy climate bill that Harry Reid will most likely roll out sometime before the end of the year. Last week, I talked to Democrats on the Energy Committee and the Foreign Relations Committee asking what they want from this bill. What do they need to see in it to support it? And we'll start with my conversation with Senator Jean Shaheen of New Hampshire. She, during an Energy Committee hearing, talked about the role of cap and trade and saying the effects of REGI, that is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in her home state of New Hampshire, give her some evidence and some sense that a cap and trade system would work economy-wide here in the U.S. I use that to point out we have an, several models that we can look at. Reggie has been working so far. It's in its early stages, but um, the reviews that I've heard from people in New Hampshire, from the business community, from the utilities, from the environmental community, have all been very supportive of where things are at this point. So I just think it's important for us to look at those models that we do have, find out what's working and what's not working. It always just irks me that we send letters to OPEC asking them to increase production when we won't increase production right here at home. Um, so that has to be important. Now whether it will affect my vote, you know, overall, I'm going to be looking at lots of things, not just that, but that's important. The other is uh, loss or increase in manufacturing jobs, expansion of nuclear power, um, new opportunities for jobs to be created in the biofuels and biomass area, which I think is important. Um, but again, you know, we don't want to decimate uh, the oil and gas industry in this country. We want to transition it smoothly. We don't want to decimate it. Now, Mary Landry said a couple of those points she wants to see in this climate bill, and these are some of the points that John Kerry and Lindsey Graham put into that op-ed, uh, an expansion of incentives for nuclear exploration, also new, excuse me, nuclear incentives for the industry, also new exploration for oil and gas here domestically and on the outer continental shelf. That is an issue, Susan, that we're also seeing more support from and actually getting traction among Republicans. Lisa Murkowski, as we reported this morning, the ranking member of the Senate Energy Committee, is now leaning a little bit in that direction, saying she could possibly support a cap and trade if there is enough new incentives included for nuclear energy and also new exploration for oil and gas. So, so there is some shifting. Right. But how much of the concern here has to do with or hinges on what happens in, in Copenhagen as mm -hmm. far as whether China and India agree to emissions cuts? Uh, that's a great question. You heard Mary Landry talking about the fact she wanted to protect jobs and manufacturing here in the U.S. And there is a main manufacturing concern in large part among Democrats here. Last week, I had the chance to talk to NRDC Policy Director David Doniger. This was at a U.S.-China forum here in Washington. He had said that there are 10 to 20 senators by the NRDC's count with serious concerns 
about trade under a cap and trade program, essentially the U.S. economy and how it would fare. Doniger told me that some of these senators are what he calls ideologically unreachable. He said they're primarily from one party. You can read into that, the Republicans. But he said there are 10 Democrats that he targeted as being potential yes votes. And these are the 10 that's recently sent a letter to President Obama expressing their concerns regarding cap and trade. Ten, for example, who signed a letter under Sherrod Brown's uh, uh, leadership uh, outlining these competitiveness measures that I've described, including a third one, which is a proposal from Senator Brown called IMPACT, which is uh, for uh, energy, in industrial energy efficiency, uh, a funding mechanism for industrial energy efficiency investments. Um, they said those three things are essential to have in, 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 in final legislation, and fortunately they are in the House bill, and they have every prospect of being in the Senate bill. You just heard Doniger mention the three things. The senator's wishes also in their letter to President Obama included a border mechanism, which again, Kerry and Graham address in their op-ed, plus sufficient allowances for U.S. industry under a cap and trade. Now, Doniger went on to say that Sherrod Brown's letter was actually misinterpreted by many as something of a shot across the bow on climate legislation. He said the opposite is true. These are actually very doable things that could get those 10 senators, all of them Democrats, to yes votes. And Susan, I think what we see emerging is, whereas in the House Energy Committee, we saw the Blue Dog Democrats playing such a key role. Those were some of the must-have votes for Henry Waxman. Now we're getting to what Doniger referred to as the Brown Dogs, the industrial state Democrats, who have certain needs and certain wants that they want to see in this legislation. If those come true tr through in the final version, they could be yes votes all the way around. All right, the march to 60 votes. Tyler's and a lot of juggling along That's the way. That's right. Tyler Suters, thank you.